uh, name is Andrew John Bennett and I am the current chair of the executive board of the GCP. The GCP was set up by a group of centres which formed a consortium and they for several years ran the work of the GCP but found that it was difficult for them to make decisions on certain issues and so they decided to set up an executive board. And our job is really reporting to the consortium committee um, but on their behalf trying to make sure that that which has been agreed and promised by the GCP is delivered. When the winding up of the GCP became a reality and the need is after 10 years to do that, the question was how were we going to do it? The executive board as I say reports to the consortium committee of the centres and so a decision was made that this was not something that the, the EB could do on its own but that we needed to have a group of people from the consortium committee, from the EB and some independent people to look at how what has been achieved and what it is that we might do both to conclude the programme at the end of 2014 and what and where the elements that have been developed and achievements that have been made might be integrated back into either CG institutes or other members of the consortium or elsewhere. So the task force was set up specifically to look at what has been achieved and how we might assure that in future that which has been achieved will have a result, have a product. Because I think we're all very keen that the work of the GCP, which is about developing tools and information, ultimately results in better varieties in the hands of farmers and therefore more reliable yields and hopefully better food security and less hunger and better incomes. The GCP has demonstrated that working in partnerships both with CG institutes and institutes outside both in the developed world and in the developing world has terrific advantages. Not always easy but in the end the product is more likely to be relevant and used. So I think the first achievement of the GCP has actually been showing that partnerships can work and that money can help drive partnerships. The second thing is that in the early stages the emphasis was on discovery. Discovery of genes and alleles and things within the genomes that could be used valuably to improve both drought resistance, heat tolerance, tolerance to abiotic stresses etc. And so it achieved a lot by identifying these um, useful uh, genes and materials. And it also showed where they might be deployed. And it, it helped to, by identifying those, show that a, a more genomically based approach to breeding um, would be um, advantageous and result in results. Uh, and produce results more quickly. I think that was the initial phase and at the time it was set up I think there was a belief that genomics on their own, on its own could and molecular breeding could produce results. I think what we have discovered is the phenotype is still very important. So it may have the genes but they express those genes express themselves differently when they are actually put into varieties and plants. So the phenotyping has become more important and I think the GCP has responded by putting greater emphasis on, on phenotyping. So its initial achievement 
it can, we can work in partnerships, we can show that there is useful, uh, there are useful genes and alleles there, and that um, these can be deployed to improve the quality of, of varieties offered to farmers. However, we cannot ignore the phenotyping. And I think that we discovered that while we could produce good tools and develop good tools, we needed to produce materials that allowed or enabled people to actually use those tools. Uh, this becomes the word capacity building. Mm -hmm. So it's not just stocking the shelves with tools, it's actually creating a community that can use them. And I think that's what we've found in some parts of the world. This is, there are plenty of people, in others there aren't. And so I think we discovered that um, progress can only be made if the whole chain is in place. And we can't just stock the shelves of the intellectual supermarket if the customers can't come through the door or don't know it exists. So communications becomes important as well. I think that it probably might not be unique, but when the challenge programs were set up in the CG, they were set up deliberately to test the idea that partnerships and short-term goals could advance areas that would otherwise not be addressed. And at this time these were set up, the whole excitement around sequencing genomes, it all of a sudden it opened up a new tool, a new opportunity, whereas beforehand you grew a plant, you thought you knew what you had in it, you grew it out in the field, and then it may or may not have it. And if it was recessive, you wouldn't know whether it had it in the first place. So all of a sudden you've got, not only you can identify the useful genes, but you can develop markers. And I think that's another achievement of the GCP, is that it has developed a suite of markers which are available in the public domain, which allows people to test whether that which you're looking for is there, even if it's hidden. Because as you probably know, when things are, are recessive, um, they don't express themselves until combined in adequate quantity for them to uh, be, um, to, for them to express themselves in the plant. So it's been unique in the CGIR, <coughs> and it's been a, a, an experiment well worth the doing. I think it's demonstrated I, I was sad that when we did the CG reform that perhaps we didn't learn as many lessons as had been learnt in the GCP about how partnerships work, um, how consortia should work, and how the strong and the not so strong organisations can work together. hope so. Um, but like all people, you can write wills and you can write legacies, but they will only be, they will be carried out by people after you. And so what we're very keen to do now in the time that is left is not only to deliver that which we have promised to deliver, and in the contracts and grants that we've got at the moment, but to start to look at how that which we have produced will remain in the public domain and hopefully will result in the better varieties um, that will help farmers improve their crops. So I think it is possible, but I think what our discussions were this morning was that this is not simply a question of saying, job done. It is a question of saying, we have delivered what we said but this raises many more issues about how that which has been delivered can be used. And one of our members said, this, was, this original program was set up to bring modern science to bear on the problems of small farmers. And we have focused on the modern science, but as she pointed out to us today, ultimately it will be not putting tools in the hands of plant breeders, but better varieties in the hands of farmers. And that's not what we've done yet. 
And so I think that the EB was, the executive board this morning was talking about where is our responsibility in that? At the moment, the mandate that we have from the consortium committee is simply to deliver what we've said we're going to deliver. We believe that we need to go back to the consortium committee and say, this is not job done, this is job initiated, we've got to move on, we've got to do, make sure or do everything we can to make sure that these products will be useful and remain in the public domain. So that's the transition. And that's, and the question is, is who's going to do that? Um, and we discussed today whether this means reconstituting the task force, which basically completed its work at the Montpellier meeting with the white papers and the overall strategy papers and the synthesis paper, or does this now mean that there is another job to do? And it will be our intention to ask the cons consortium committee and the consortium of the CG whether they, who, who and how they want this done. There has been a neglect in many countries of both tertiary education and capacity building. And that is not just within those countries, but the donor community as well. In the mid-90s, there was a big swing away from education at all levels to focusing on primary education, which is very important when it comes to empowerment for women and basic general literacy in a country. But in the end, the people who are going to run institutes, do this sort of work, need not only primary but secondary and tertiary education. And institutes need investment. You know, they are an important part of paraphernalia. But they're not there, they shouldn't just be invested, given money because they exist. They've got to deliver something. And so there's been an element of not delivering in many parts of the world. So capacity building is a never-ending task. You know, one generation goes, another one must come in. And as we've seen in many parts of the world, the joint impacts of illness through HIV, malaria and other things, um, and neglect of some of these institutes left a big hole in institutional capacity. And there are some countries in the world that could benefit hugely from molecular breeding and other things, which just do not, they have one breeder, two breeders, uh, all of whom are probably aging. So there is a lot of catching up to do. But it, you know, capacity building is often very popular with people. You, know, you offer training courses, and people like to meet, they like to do things. But in the end, it's got to be justified by producing something at the end. So I think GCP has made a good start, but the job is not done. I, I don't know. I think success would be the integration of the breeding activities within the new consortium research programs or research programs at institutions outside. The development of the integrated breeding, breeding platform and capacity building, that's a, a really important tool but tools are only useful if people want to buy them. And at the moment, this is still a gleam in our eye. A lot of hard work's gone into it. Very quickly, we have to decide, is this going to fly? If it does fly, then the integrated breeding platform will be the main legacy. And the question is, where will it thrive? Should this be virtual, electronic, or should it have a physical location somewhere? Um, and those are questions which we need to be addressed. But until we've got the product, until we've tested that product, until we've got a response from those who should be using it, and you know, there are probably less than five, 10,000 plant breeders in the world. So it's not a big ask. You know, probably the, the Simit Informer goes to more than 10,000 people. 
So to some extent, knowing what those people think about it should not be impossible. The question is, is whether we can develop it to the state quick enough to capture their enthusiasm. Then the issue is, how will it be funded in the future? Will it be a membership organisation that people pay a, a fee to join on those who can't afford are subsidised in some way? Will it remain a public good funded by a generous donor? Or will it sell its services to those who can pay to raise income? And that will mean, you know, it may not look like a GCP as it currently is, but it may be uh, an extraordinarily valuable piece of kit.